You don't want to put cellular genomes into your virus particles. Often the cellular genomes or the mRNAs or DNAs are in vast excess. So there has to be a way to distinguishing them wherever the assembly is occurring. And remember, there's no way really to distinguish between RNA and DNA, whether it's viral or uh, host, unless you have a specific signal, because DNA is DNA and uh, RNA is RNA. For example, retrovirus genomes are less than 1% of the total cytoplasmic RNA, yet they're the only RNAs that end up in particles, majority of uh, anyway. And this is a reflection of the fact that these genomes, these viruses don't replicate. Remember, they depend on Paul II to make transcripts in the nucleus so that they can be encapsulated. So there's not a lot of viral RNA, yet that's what gets specifically packaged. And that's because for many viruses, there are packaging signals in the genome. And that's exactly what the word says. It is a signal saying, I need to get to a capsid protein to be incorporated into a particle. And these have been found in many viral genomes not in all, though, and maybe the ones where we haven't found them have other mechanisms of packaging, but I want to tell you about this one first. So the way you identify a packaging sequence, or one way that you can identify a packaging sequence, is to make mutations in the genome and then ask, what, under what conditions in an infection <coughs> with this mutant genome do we get particles and nucleic acids, but the two don't come together? We never make an infectious virion. So here are two examples of how this has been done. Here is adenovirus. And remember, adenovirus has a pretty long uh, double-stranded DNA genome. And we're showing that here. And here's the left end, the origin of replication, all the way at the left end, remember. And the packaging sequences are shown here in blue arrows. You see they're near the left end. They're quite near within a few hundred bases of the origin of replication. They overlap with the uh, enhancer, which helps uh, to initiate transcription. And these are simply overlapping sequences whose presence are necessary for this DNA to be incorporated into the adenovirus capsid. If you make changes in these sequences, you decrease or abolish that ability. So these are packaging sequences. You take them out or you take this whole chunk of DNA out, you will affect the ability of this DNA to get into the capsid. And then at the bottom uh, is the same sort of sequence for SV40, the smaller a double-stranded circular DNA genome. Uh, here is the enhancer of SV40, the origin of replication, and the early transcription unit. And you can see the packaging signal is right here in this uh, region uh, around these transcription factor binding sites. So again, these sequences, if you change them, the viral DNA doesn't get into the capsid. So these are packaging sequences. And if the virus doesn't have these, they won't get packaged. And this is why cellular nucleic acids don't get packaged, because they don't have these uh, sequences. In some cases, you can transfer these sequences to, say, other DNAs and get those DNAs packaged. Herpes virus genomes also have packaging sequences. And they are located at the left end of the long double-stranded DNA genome. So here on the top is the entire genome. We're expanding the left end at the bottom here. And the packaging sequences are called PAC1 and PAC2. Uh, they are part of an element called the A element at the very left end. And you can see that A element repeated uh, here at the end of the UL region and then finally at the other end of the genome. And these two packaging sequences uh, are needed for this viral DNA to get into a virion. The way that works is shown on the right. Now you may remember that the genome replicates as a rolling circle and makes head-to-tail concatomers, very long unit length molecules of the genome. And that's the substrate for encapsidation. So here uh, is a concatomer of, of genomes shown bound to the portal on the herpes capsid. Remember, there's one portal on the capsid. It's the way that the DNA can get in. And the portal binds the genome, this is actually part of the termination process of DNA replication. This is a, a termination assembly of proteins here, and within it are the packaging sequences. You can see PAC1 here. So this specific part of the genome acts, uh, interacts with the portal together with these sequences, and then the DNA gets pulled into the capsid. There is a motor activity in this portal that pulls, winds the DNA in, if you will. You can see that happening here. The head is filling up with with viral DNA. 
And then there are two signals that tell the packaging process that it should stop and go no further. One is when you have a head full of DNA, that is you have a, a, a unit length genome, and that can be uh, discerned by uh, going from one A repeat to the other. And the other is that you have now uh, these packaging sequences in opposition here. So a head full and both packaging sequences are located here. And then that signals an endonuclease to cleave uh, the DNA, and now you have a single genome in the head. So you have a full length genome signaled by not only a head full, but also the two packaging sequences. So that prevents you from cleaving the DNA here. You have to wait till the head is full with the entire genome, and then you have another set of packaging sequences uh, down at the other end. So it's an interesting combination of mechanisms, <coughs> including the packaging sequence. So those are two DNA genome examples. Uh, let's look at how RNA viruses package their genomes. And these are examples from the retroviruses. Um, on the left for, is an example of the HIV uh, packaging signal. And let's start down here at the lower left. This is the left end of the viral RNA genome. And you may remember the primer binding site. That's where the tRNA is binding to initiate reverse transcriptase. Uh, the packaging sequence is shown here. It's called psi. The Greek symbol psi indicates the packaging sequence. And you can see that um, it's a highly structured area with several stem loop SL structures here. And what's thought to happen is, remember that every retrovirus virion has two, two RNA genomes in it. Well, in the case of HIV, what's thought is you form a, what's called a kissing loop complex. These two stem loops of adjacent RNAs interact in this way. They base pair uh, and they form a complex, which is then the substrate for packaging. We'll see how that works in a minute. And this is important, but there are other signals in the genome as well that are needed for genome packaging. So this sequence alone will not suffice. On the right are some other retroviral packaging signals. Here is uh, Maloney murine leukemia virus. Uh, this is a rather simple packaging sequence. The psi sequence is right there. You can take that short RNA sequence and put it, put it into other mRNAs and they will get packaged. So this is necessary and sufficient for packaging. Now this is interesting because um, you re may remember that in addition to the full length viral mRNA, there is a spliced product in some retroviruses and that goes, that removes this sequence from here to here and that allows you to translate the envelope glycoprotein, the very last uh, protein coded in the genome. Envelope messenger RNAs are never packaged in, ret in Maloney retrovirus virions and that's because the splice removes the packaging sequence. So that's a neat way to just get full length genomes into the virion because those are the only ones that have uh, the splicing signal. Unfortunately, that doesn't apply for all retroviruses. Here is one where the, splice, uh, the psi signal is upstream of the five prime splice site. Okay, so this is also necessary and sufficient for splicing, but in fact, envelope messages don't get packaged. So there's something else that is uh, regulating that as well. So, uh, this is a cool example of excluding envelope from uh, the, the virion, but this is not. Biology is not always neat. You know, there are always exceptions to uh, every rule. So let's go back and look at the HIV uh, packaging scheme. Remember this kissing loop. You have two RNAs in the, G in the virion, and they're going to interact. So if you have just one RNA, we'll, we'll show this as two stem loop structures. And the protein that binds the RNA that gets the RNA into the virion is the nucleocapsid protein, NC. And the monomeric RNA, just one RNA molecule, will not bind NC protein. But when you have two in a virion, they then interact. So these are now two RNA molecules forming these kissing interactions. So here is one in yellow coming around there. And then the second molecule is green. You can see the green is base pairing with the yellow. So the two molecules are base pairing. And this base pairing exposes um, sequences which can then bind NC. And these are these uh, red and yellow sequences with the exposed bases, if you will. These are contacts for the protein. Now NC can bind um, this RNA. And that can then get incorporated into the virion. Remember, NC is part of that precursor 
the matrix capsid NC precursor that binds to the plasma membrane. So this is how NC binds the RNA. It brings it up to the plasma membrane. Do I have a slide? No, I don't have a slide of that. But you, if you go back a few and look at that, when these particles are getting ready to bud, you have the viral proteins assembling at the membrane with the RNA bound to the NC. And this is how NC binds the RNA. So then NC in turn is part of the gag precursor that gets uh, assembled into budding particles. And then all of that is cleaved by the protease. And that's what causes the final uh, maturation. It's not so straightforward for other viral RNAs. <clears throat> Uh, poliovirus, for example, doesn't seem to have a packaging signal. No one has been able to identify one anyway. And we don't know what allows for specific packaging because these virus particles do not incorporate any cellular mRNA. So there may be the, the polymerase itself is a determinant of packaging. As polymerase replicates the molecule, maybe those are molecules that are getting packaged. This is something that remains to be sorted out. Now, in general, when you have an icosahedral particle, you are limited as to how much extra nucleic acid you can put in. And so if you want to do gene vectoring in viruses, the icosahedral particles, you can only put 5 or 10% more than the genome in. The, the envelope viruses have more flexibility because they can grow. In fact, these vesicular st stomatitis viruses, rabies-like viruses, can get quite long as you put more and more uh, DNA in them. They're not unlimited, but you can generally fit more in. Now, how about a segmented genome? This is a very interesting problem. If you have a virus with, you know, three or eight or 10 or 12 segments, how do you make sure that every particle gets the right number of segments? Not only the right number, but the right ones, eight unique segments or 10 unique segments or whatever. So there are two models. There are random and specific models. And so, for example, and they're hard to distinguish. So flu, for example, has eight segments. And if you say there's just random packaging of any eight RNAs, in fact, that would give you one infectious particle for every 400 assembles. So remember, you have a pool of RNAs in the cell. If you just say, I'm going to grab any eight, that would give you one out of 400 infectious <coughs> particles, which turns out to be about what the particle to PFU ratio is for this virus. Remember, that's how many defective uh, infectious particles you make per total number of particles. If you had 12 segments, which some viruses do, 10% of the particles would have the complete viral genome. So it's, there's a school of thought which says a lot of these uh, viruses with segmented genomes simply grab the right number of segments and, and go from there. But there is some evidence for specific packaging. And this came, has come up recently for influenza virus. And um, this is based on the fact that if you do electron micrographs of influenza particles, you see uh, quite a regular arrangement of segments within each virion. So at the bottom here, each of these spherical uh, objects is a virion, of course. You can see the glycoproteins on the outside. And inside, you can, say, you can see a very specific arrangement of the eight segments. So here's a model on top of how this looks. So it looks like the eight segments are lined up in parallel form in each virion. And there's some evidence that uh, there are se sequences on the ends of each RNA that specify this. So there could be signals on each genome that tell it to go into a particle so that you don't have to be uh, depending on a random mechanism of packaging. There is uh, one virus that I know of that does selective packaging, which is quite interesting. And this is a bacteriophage called Phi6. And this is a bacteriophage that has three double-stranded RNA segments in its genome. It's an icosahedral uh, virion, as you can see here, uh, with an envelope. And it has three segments. And those, those go in in order. The first segment to go in is the S, the smallest segment. Apparently, there's some interaction between that segment and the protein shell. And then only when S is in there does M go in. So M entry depends on S. And then finally, if L wants to go in, uh, S, this should be M here. A L depends on the presence of S and M. OK, so you have a sequential packaging mechanism which depends on each of the previous segments being there. And maybe that's why this virus has a particle to PFU ratio of 1. So that means that every particle that a cell makes is infectious, which is really 
remarkable. There are not a lot of viruses that are like this, and it may be that serial dependence of packaging uh, accounts for this rather than randomly selecting. 